squad, Clint Schweitzer, Noah Groniger, and welcome to our Friday the 13th 6 Jason Lives retrospective. We've kind of pushed the reset button here on our Screen Squad show. We've done a lot of interviews over the years, but we're kind of bringing it and making it, uh, putting it in video form or bringing on some guests. We're going to be doing it, uh, doing it a little different here and doing mo only movies really that we care about and actors we like. Yes, movies, TV shows, whatever it is. This is kind of a new format for us. I think you're going to enjoy it with a little video intro, then get to the interviews. It's going to be nice and we're going to have a lot more coming. We're really delving back into this. Uh, it's been a while since we've done our last interview with an actor. Uh, maybe Brad Leland, I think, was the one from uh, Friday Night Lights, yeah. this TV show. Uh, but definitely, we're going to be bringing you a lot more, so definitely stay tuned. Not just this one, there's a lot more coming. You can also uh, find us on iTunes if you want just the uh, the audio format, Screen Squad podcast on iTunes, guys. And, uh, you know, right now, this is our Friday the 13th 6, Jason Lives retrospective. Um, a lot of people's favorite entry into the Friday the 13th series, we're going to be talking about this film. It just turned 31 years old uh, on August 1st, the 31st anniversary. Are we talking about with another fan, or who, who do we have coming on today? Surely it's another fan. Surely yeah. it's just someone else that really one of our friends art. maybe a friend no 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 well no. he is a friend but he is a friend of the show but it's going to be uh, director himself tom mclaughlin's going to be coming on to and talk writer about it. He wrote the film as well. Wrote the film. He's the only Friday um, Friday personnel to write and direct exactly. And yeah. uh, Jason Lives is uh, it's it's one of those films that. I think encapsulates a lot about what the Friday the 13th franchise was all about and what it became. It's a lot of people's favorite in the series. It is definitely mine. I think it was uh, because it it, it, um, it it poked fun. It was it did not take itself too seriously. It was satirical in a lot of ways. And a lot of people really enjoyed uh, the humor element, the gothic horror element that Tom McLaughlin was able to bring to it. We're going to ask him about that. Jason Lives, I think to me, is the definitive Friday the 13th film. I think you said that was the first one you saw, so that kind of holds a special place in your heart, and that's your favorite. It's a lot of other people's favorite, too. Even people that didn't, that wasn't their first one they saw. It's still people's favorite. I'd have to say it's my second favorite, maybe for the only reason I saw two first, and two is a strong one. It's one that holds up. It's not like I saw five first, or Jason Goes <laughs> to Hell first, so that's my favorite. Thank goodness. It's, that's my favorite one of all time. I love the changing bodies and the thing going in people's mouths. It's, it's such a great film, but... <laughs> Well, I think and Jason Lives and a lot of it is uh, the pop culture element. Uh, Tom McLaughlin was able, because as a, as a rock and roll guy himself, we're going to talk to him about his band. He has a band called The Sloths. So we're going to talk to him about that. But uh, you see our shirts right now. Alice Cooper uh, had three songs on the soundtrack. I'm a huge Alice Cooper fan. Uh, to me, it all just came together. You had uh, sort of these the elements of these kids just uh, you bringing in children into the play. Into, yes. Into Camp Crystal Lake, uh, which was called Forest Green. We've actually been to You're the wondering location. if they would go as far as to kill a child. You, it keeps you dangling. You're like, I'm not sure, but it adds another element to it that's huge. And, and another thing, we've been able to visit the location. Yeah. Camp Daniel Morgan is where a lot of this was filmed. That's where the camp scenes were filmed uh, down in Rutledge, Georgia. It's uh, about 45 minutes away from Athens, kind of an hour, hour and a half away from Atlanta area. So able to visit that, able to see the lake. And if you're ever there, able to fly a drone for a couple minutes before <laughs> can't, can't the talk about Rangers that comes up and says, no, can't but, be doing that. You know, and what this film, what it is, it was a low budget film, $3 million. And what they were able to do with it, what Tom McLaughlin, when you, when you talk to him, he has the way he talks about it. It's as if he's talking about, you know, like a, a Fellini film or something like that. But actually, <laughs> and that's what they thought of it. And that's yeah, yeah. they made the best film they could. I give them huge props for that. A film, I think, be, the, the reason why I call it The Definitive Friday is because what came after that? We, it set the tone for what the, uh, the zombie uh, undead Jason was. The video game, the Friday the 13th video game, I think a lot of it was modeled after the the story in part six and the kind of going around to the cabins and the kids being involved and that big that game was a hit for NES certainly and of course now Tom has come back to do some work on the latest part of the thirteenth game which has gotten huge great reviews. Yeah, and you mentioned the pop culture aspect. You talked about Alice Cooper. Yeah. Also, Arnold Horshack from Welcome Back, yes. Connor. A big pop culture yeah. thing in there. Ron Palillo uh, was uh, Tom Matthews' friend in it yeah. at the beginning. And uh, he didn't last long, but it was great to see him in there. And just the beautiful shots in this thing. I agree. Uh, you have the stunt of the RV flipping on its side. Jason coming out, standing on top of that with a fire around it. Uh, other shots of kind of the counselor talking to Nancy. She stands up, and Jason's in the mirror, looking or in the window, looking down on both of them. Uh, just beautiful shots in this thing. Uh, some things that maybe didn't quite work for me, but the film stands. It's such a small detail, and like you mentioned, they needed more kills in this thing. So the paintball scenes and how that didn't quite fit for me, but you went, they need more kills. They need him to get his weapons. How's that, how's right. that going to get done? And so in that aspect, it does work. 
We want to welcome our guest here on the Screen Squad as we continue our Friday the 13th Part 6 retrospective. It's crazy. Tom McLaughlin, welcome to the show. I mean, I tell you what, it is uh, unbelievable. Uh, Friday the 13th 6 just turned 31 years old as of August 1st, I believe. So that's kind of crazy. Man, you have no idea. I don't mean, is this night before you guys were born? Yeah, yeah, we were, uh, I was 84, no, we were both 84, yeah. so it was uh, It was right after we were born, so we grew up with this film yeah. as if it was a, a young brother or, or sister, it was, uh, it, it was just one of those things that was part of the, part of the lexicon of our upbringings, like, good or bad, you could be blamed for that, possibly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, I, I mean, I, but my, my parents blamed uh, Universal Studios for, um, you know, Frankenstein, Dracula, the Wolfman, you know, all of that, that was so much part of my life. And then once I got to be old enough to figure out, oh, I don't have to go to school on this bus. I can take the bus all the way to the theater that, uh, you know, start showing movies at noon. And that was all like the, you know, the classical, you know, Hammer Horror films and, uh, you know, Edgar Allan Poe stories that, uh, uh, that, Roger Corman was doing so. Yeah, I, I same thing. I'm in a very corrupted youth. <laughs> well, that's that's a big part of it. That's why uh, that's why we're here right now. We all either enjoy the film or made the film, and that here we are. Uh, and and th what I've always wondered because you um, are one of the few Friday directors that actually uh, also wrote the script for the film. So you're the writer and director of Part Six. Well, there's two things you know for either you guys or if you want to you know put it out there to your you know, fans of your, of your site and all that is, uh, if you go on YouTube, um, there is a five minute, five, six minute short, uh, documentary that they did as a supplemental thing for, uh, Camp Crystal Lake memories. And it's called on YouTube, Legends Never Die, Hollywood Forever. And Basically, what that shows is me at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery and telling you, you know, how I wrote the script there and also kind of what my plans are after I'm gone. And uh, it really gives you a kind of a, you know, overall idea of what was happening there. The, the other thing is the book that Joe Madri did called uh, uh, Strange Idea of Entertainment conversations with Tom McLaughlin and he spent like three months with me and he mined so much stuff, you know, out of the process of how that movie came together. In fact, you know, all the films I've done, you know, he, he went into and television things that, that I did. And the one really cool thing he did is he put the actual treatment for my Friday the 13th in the back of the book. So, Fans can read that and see how exact, you know, the movie, you know, followed that treatment. So I was, very, again, very fortunate that I had Frank Mancuso, who was, you know, the executive producer on the film, really allowing me, you know, to take, you know, the ideas I wanted. And all he asked of me is bring back Jason, and if you're going to put comedy in it, we'll make fun of him. And I said, no, I have no, I have no intention of making fun of him. I just want the characters to have a sense of humor. I want my approach to have a little kind of sly wink at the at the genre itself. Uh, well, can you talk about some of the lessons you learned? Uh, you mentioned uh, during the DVD commentary uh, how uh, you learned from Frank Frank Capra, uh, just kind of making elements uh, part of the story. You can see just the wind, the leaves, the lightning, and uh, also just uh, that there are no rules in filmmaking, only sins, and the cardinal sin is boredom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how do, how do you know that quote? That's great. We just watched the DVD last night, you know, it's brushed up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was I was very fortunate to actually have a, a relationship, friendship with uh, Frank Capra. So I got a lot of the stuff that, you know, he had in his book and then just reactions to the to the next movie I did after Friday, which was Date with an Angel. And so, I mean, it was great to have him be, you know, in my life and be such an influence. But the main thing I got from Capra is that, you know, it's a people-to-people -people medium that we're dealing with here. And if you like the people, you'll like the movie, you know. you And so I was very, very, very headstrong on, you know, trying to make, you know, enjoyable characters, then bring in the element of children, which they've never had in the 80s. And I don't know if anybody's done it since uh, on, on the franchise. But for me, it was like, oh, my God, they're not going to kill kids, are they? And I thought, you know, that and that moment of, 
you know, Jason looming over the little girl, Nancy, uh, was just sort of, you know, classic nightmare, you know, for a child, you know, to have the monster in the room and looming over you. And then by, you know, he wasn't going to do anything. He was just staring, you know, because, you know, it's like he hasn't seen a child before um, kind of thing. And so he, you know, when he disappears, then she does the thing that all kids do. Either you check in the closet or in her case, you know, look under the bed. Is that where the monster went? So, you know, they were elements of humor and kind of classic gothic horror that I tried to put through that, you know, film. And in the same same way, they, like you mentioned, you know, elements of, of wind and rain and, um, you know, you know, the sense of storm coming, all, all those different things that kind of were also, you know, dark um, elements that made the film all the more in that kind of classic gothic fashion. And, and a lot of people will to this day attest to this being the definitive uh, Jason, the definitive Jason look, the way he moved, uh, everything that uh, since Jason died in part four, everything you see after that is kind of molded after what uh, what your Jason wound up being. And I think that's a big testament to C.J. Graham, who was an underrated Jason to me. I love Kane Hodder, but I think C.J. Graham played a, a wonderful Jason in this. And I know you use a different uh, stunt guy during some of the day scenes, but what a great job C.J. did kind of bringing this zombie Jason or whatever you want to call it to life. Yeah, um, uh, you know, Dan Bradley, who we started the film with, was both our stunt coordinator and Jason. And all the daytime stuff, you know, is Dan. And if you've been, you know, you'll notice it when you look at the film, you know, he definitely has a different build and a different way he moves. Not, you know, incredibly different because I, you know, I have mind training, you know, having gone to Paris when I was 19 and studied with Marcel Marceau, I worked very physically, you know, with, with roles, um, either the ones I played myself or in this case, you know, uh, for Jason. And my thought was, if he was brought back with a lightning bolt on a Frankenstein, there's going to be kind of a, a corpse that moves, not like a zombie, you know, you know, but more in a, you know, unstoppable machine, um, which I guess has a little bit of the, of the Terminator aspect. But again, I wasn't using any of those references when I was working with the actor. I was just showing both Dan and CJ, you know, how I wanted him to move, how his head would turn, you know, that moment when the, you see the motorhome bouncing up and down, they have him kind of tilt his head from side to side like the dog, you know. So there's a lot of animal and mechanical things that are part of his, his movement. And it kind of set, yeah, the tone of, okay, this is a Jason that is absolutely unstoppable. And you can't kill him, you can shoot him, and, and, and you know, that force that's in him now is just, you know, unstoppable. So, you know, all those things to me, you know, gave him much more of a monster. And the wonderful thing about the 80s is what we who were doing the movies in the 80s, we got to kind of bring real monsters back. You know, Freddy and obviously Michael Myers and uh, Chucky and Pinhead from Hell Right, Razor. And I mean, it's, it was, you know, an incredible time for the audiences that they could be a series of, of uh, monster movies like Universal did with all the Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, Son of Frankenstein, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, you know, the Wolfman movies, the, you know, Dracula movies, the Son of Dracula. I mean, it, it, it really followed that same kind of, you like this monster? Well, here he is back again. Um, even to the point that when, when I finished the movie and Frank said, would you do another one? And I said, yeah, what do you have in mind? And he said, what do you think about Jason and Freddy meeting up? And I go, yeah. wait a minute. Um, you mean, he's with New Line. How are you going to do that? He says, well, we're going to talk to them about that. You know, and I said, well, he, you know, he exists in the dream realm, you know, and Jason is very, you know, you know, on land and water. You know, and he's, you know, unstoppable in that way. You know, Freddy can get in and out of your dreams and all that. And but well, we're going to try. So it turns out that New Line did not want to make that deal. And he's asked me if I still wanted to do one. And I said, well, you guys own Cheech and Chong, right? I said, why don't we do an Abbott and Costello, you know, type, you know, meet Frankenstein type thing and say Cheech and Chong meet Jason. And I think it's <laughs> you know. You know, those dudes like out the park rangers or, 
you know, something. <laughs> and, you know, and go through that whole thing. You know, what is, hey, dude, what is Jason, man? Oh, shit, you think so? You know, and, you know, I just thought it'd be hysterical. And he goes, he said, I love it. Obviously, there'd be certain people that love it, but I think the fans would be pissed off because, you know, you're either going to come see a Jason movie or you're going to come see a Cheech Chong movie. I don't know if that would service both, you know, both audiences. I go, I don't know. It'd be fun to try, you know, and he goes, now we, we're on a roll here with yours. So, you know, we got to keep, you know, keep the serious tone and, and that going. So, you know, that didn't happen. But it is, again, kind of that legacy. You know, you create a monster and then you try to find all these different ways to put him into things. And obviously, you know, we almost had our Friday the 13th, 13th one. And I, know, I, I still think it's going to get made some way, somehow. Um, but, you know, it, every movie after mine, you know, they had to, they had to kind of push, you know, even further, you know, with, you know, Jason meets Carrie, Jason goes to hell, Jason goes, you know, Manhattan, you know, and then of course, eventually, you know, Jason and Freddie did beat up. Yeah. And we mentioned uh, how CJ Graham was maybe one of the best Jasons, but uh, your wife, Nancy was in the movie. She was in a scene with CJ. Uh, he threw the spear through the windshield. He almost actually hit her. Would you guys have been looking for a new Jason and fired CJ? Had that actually happened? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I would have been looking for a new wife. Uh, <laughs> That's... But yeah, that was, that was one of those things where we hired, you know, uh, CJ, who, you know, we're still really close friends. And I'm hoping, you know, we can do some of these conventions together now that he's you know, stopped his regular job, basically retired, and, and he's doing these conventions. And in the whole Jason, you know, uh, appearance, you know, uh, Kane Hodder's been doing these these conventions, and I love Kane, too. He's incredibly, you know, funny and out-there guy. But, you know, he's not done what CJ's doing, which is allowing the fans to, you know, stand next to Jason. And, and CJ's huge. So, I mean, it, I don't know if you've seen any of the pictures online, but it looks... It looks just so great, and they have a backdrop and things. And so he's really, you know, kind of do, doing this full on now, and you know, kind of accepting the fact that so many people just, you know, love his Jason. It was, uh, you know, very unique. And he wanted to do the next one, but uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Bugler, uh, who was directing the next one. Uh, he, I guess, he already had a relationship with Kane, and uh, you know, decided that you know, that's the way he wanted to go. Well, I want to talk about the, the location of this because uh, we, we have visited this. It's, um, the, the camp was in uh, Hard Labor State Park in, in Georgia, about an hour outside of Atlanta. We we visited this location. By the way, they don't like you coming down there talking about Jason or asking about Jason. So anyone that listens to this, don't just uh, pretend like you're trying to rent the place. This was a functioning camp. Uh, my question is, how, how did you find this location? Did you have a location scout that, that did this? Because all this was filmed in around a 30-mile radius of Covington, Madison area, kind of a remote area in Georgia. How did you find this location, and how did the cast and crew kind of uh, where did you guys stay how did the whole thing play out uh well you know it was it was the kind of thing where by the time they got to this particular um friday they decided that since it's paramount doing it but they have to pretend it wasn't paramount you know they made sure that the movie uh had nothing you know jason or anything horror uh was associated with it so uh, Frank Mancuso, you know, was a huge David Bowie fan, would, you know, would name, you know, the movies with these bogus titles. So ours was Aladdin Fame. And, you know, which is, you know, perfect, you know, uh, for, for the movie, if you, once you know what it actually is. Uh, we had a location scout whose marching orders was just get it out of California. We can't, you know, we can't have any problems with the unions and all the rest of that. And it was the time of year where we had to find something where there was, you know, forest and, and you know, something. And I didn't want things to look too, too green. You know, I, I'd much rather to have, have it feel a little, you know, dark. In fact, I wrote a scene where the daytime stuff was supposed to be in a forest that was actually burnt. So you can see on a couple of the shots, you know, where we were able to do that. But a lot of the other things, it was just too big a job. So we scouted um, Alabama, we scouted uh, Louisiana, and, uh, you know, and Georgia. And, you know, she went around and took pictures and stuff. I went to, you know, cemeteries and 
talk to people and we were looking for camps and things. And she, you know, found this, you know, Camp Morgan. And, um, you know, when she sent pictures, I went, this is great. I mean, lake and the cabins and the look and everything. And um, we, you know, so it sort of was like once we decided that, then we just needed to find everything else around it. And we couldn't get a decent cemetery, so, um, you know, we built one, uh, which basically was the, all the stuff you see at night. Um, then all the daytime stuff was a, was a cemetery there, and we just had to be very respectful what we did and how we did it, you know, um, because of the kind of film it was, obviously. Um, and then we stayed, yeah, um, I think it was like in a one-story holiday inn in Covington, uh, and we had the Waffle House as uh, the main place for dining. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was, it was uh, what can I say, the, the good life. Um, but, yeah, we were shooting six days a week and nights, other than that first week um, or the first five days. So everything was night. So we completely were vampires. You know, we, we went to sleep as the sun was going up, you know, we got up before the sun was going down and then went out to the location and then, you know, shot all night. And then the sun, you know, as it came up, was like, okay, boys, we're over. And, you know, back in the vans and, you know, back to, to Covington. And then we used downtown Covington, you know, I think, as you know, for all the stuff, that, you know, the police station and, and all that. Um, so, yeah, we just kind of, you know, worked in and around and, People were incredible. The people that we had from there locally that were working with us, you know, were, were lovely. The kids that we had and their parents were incredibly supportive, uh, which was really a godsend. And we were just very, you know, careful and safe with everything, we, you know, we did. And uh, it, it was probably of the 42 films I've done now in my career, that was the most fun by far. Well, although he had a short time on screen, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about the great Ron Palillo, best known for his role as Arnold Horshack in Welcome Back, Cotter. Uh, funny enough, he was uh, in that with John Travolta, and he was in your film with uh, Tom Fridley, John Travolta's nephew. How did it come about that uh, Ron Palillo was in this, and what was your experience like uh, working with him? Well, he wasn't what I initially envisioned for the character, um, you know, the character of Hawes was, was kind of based on my best friend, who also co-wrote One Dark Night with uh, Michael Hawes. So I was looking for kind of more of like a, a buddy, like, you know, like my friend was, just as a kind of a tribute to him. Um, but then, you know, the casting person said, uh, you know, what about Ron Palilla? And I said, Horshack? <laughs> he said, yeah. And I went, you know, I mean, because I did this with my first, movie One Dark Night, you know, they, Adam West's name came up and I go, really? Batman? And he goes, well, you know, he can, he can do other things. He's a good actor, <laughs> just no one will cast him. And that was the reason I cast him. As soon as I, you know, somebody said, oh, no one will take him, I go, no, fuck that. No, I'll, I'll cast that, man. <laughs> so, same thing, you know, Ron Palillo, I thought, you know, this could be really strange, but then I thought, you know, it's going to be kind of funny and quirky, and I could believe that he would be sort of like the Salminio, you know, uh, you know, uh, companion to, J you know, James Dean in Rebel Without a Cause, you know, this kind of skinny little quirky guy. Um, and I thought, you know, that kind of works to me, that, that he's like the nervous Nelly and, and worrying about what the hell is going on. But, you know, he looks up to Tommy, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a, you know, kind of a hero to him just you know, because obviously he's very driven everything that the, the, you know, the Ron Palillo character wasn't. So, yeah, it was, you know, to me a great, you know, great fit, and Ron was terrific to work with, and it was so heartbreaking, you know, when he passed on a few years ago, because um, I was hoping, you know, we could pitch, you know, hook up again with some of these conventions and things that, that we do. But, yeah, that's where that came from. And Tom Fridley was just a freaky thing where he came in. I loved him. You know, and I said, you know he, who he looks kind of like? And she's, <laughs> Cassie Burst says, you know, John Travolta. I said, yeah, yeah, it's, it's his cousin. <laughs> I go, this is a weird thing. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's 
Hollywood guys. What can it's, I say? It's unbelievable. We've had, we've had Tom and uh, Darcy DeMoss both on this show before. Of course, the famous um, sex scene between the two, and no nudity though. I think that was kind of an interesting. Maybe the only Friday with no nudity, and you've you've talked about that before in interviews. But uh, Darcy to me is one of the hottest Friday girls, and uh, she she has sex but doesn't have her top off. So we get kind of one without the other, you know. So we're still waiting to see Darcy in, in her full full frontal. We still got to see that sometime yeah. somewhere. She's still beautiful, by the way. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, we're very close Facebook friends. We're always, yeah. you know, things back and forth. And you know, you know, she always invites me to parties and things, and I'm always doing something. So I've yet to get over there, you know, to see her and her husband's place. But yeah, Darcy, this was really a choice, you know, that I was making because I. I didn't really buy into the whole concept of, you know, Jason only kills people that are having sex and a lot of the things that sort of became, you know, these cliches. Because I, I just, you know, I mean, it's funny to say that there's this sort of moral thing in Jason, but I wanted to go at it with, uh, look, you know, Tommy pulled him up from the dead. He, he was very happy being down there, you know, maggots or not. And... <laughs> In all the great monsters, you know, there's always a line at some point in, in the, those films where, you know, you know, Frankenstein says, you know, you know, love, dead, date, living. And Dracula says, you know, to, you know, to be really dead must be glorious. And, you know, Wolfman did not want to be the Wolfman. I mean, all of this, you know, the mummy did not want to get dug up, you know. So I just thought that the fact that Tommy did this, you know, didn't mean to have it happen, but now Jason has an agenda. I'm going to get this fucker. And <laughs> goes after him, and there's obviously a history, you know, with the Tommy Jarvis character. And so the movie now has, like, okay, who's going to get who? You know, um, and in his quest to get to this kid and, and go back to the camp where, you know, he kind of instinctively knows, like the horse going back to the, the barn, uh, anybody in his way you know, goes down. Anything that, you know, looks strange to him, like the motorhome bouncing up and down. I mean, you know, he goes over to check it out, pulls the plug and, you know, and then, you know, he, you know, he, the, the, the kills in there were to me very, very unique, especially Darcy's, you know, that I, I thought, you know, wouldn't it be interesting that he push her face, you know, right through, you know, the, the tin of the, of the motorhome and, you know, Tom's kill uh, Tom Fridley's skill had to be something that, you know, obviously impaired him so much that that motorhome was going to be flying in the air, you know, and crashing down, which is our, you know, big, big stunt uh, in the film. So it, it really was a question of, these, you know, finding something different to do. And Darcy, when she said on the day, you know, I said, you know, well, how do you feel about taking your top off? And she goes, uh, you know, I didn't sign on to do that. And I go, I know, but I wanted to wait and see how you felt and get to know me and things. And she said, I just don't feel really comfortable. And I said, fine, you know, let's do a fucking scene. You at your top and Tom is his, you know, top off and you'll be riding him. And it'll be, you know, I don't know. I've seen a lot of sexy scenes where people jump each other's bones and they're not undressed. And it's all the more, you know, interesting to me. But, you know, imagination. And, you know, I thought the fans would be upset, you know, those who come to see that. But I, I was hoping that with everything else in the movie that, you know, they could look past that one thing because I wanted to be respectful to Darcy. Well, Jason seemed intrigued by it. You, said, you mentioned how he tilted his head. He was intrigued, wondering what was going on. If maybe Darcy, he could get yeah. a peek of Darcy in there. <laughs> uh, well, you, you talk about doing these conventions, uh, Tom, and I tell you, what I think is great about this is how it, it kind of brings the fans together. You get to hear some of their stories, some of their takes. What's What's been your experiences doing some of these conventions and some of the things that maybe fans have said to you or things that really make you realize that what, what you did? I mean, you, you had a small budget for this. I think it was around $3 million. It's a Friday the 13th movie. People like to throw these movies out as, as trash. But what you did is you made a you made a mark on the American lexicon in a film that I think stands the test of time as a horror sequel. Just kind of talk about some of the things that you've, uh, your experiences with, uh, with the conventions. Well, the first big, oh my God, I don't believe this, was the critics. That it's been, I think, the only Friday that's actually gotten, you know, decent reviews. And, and um, I mean, there was certainly, it, they, it has its usual distractors. And, you know, Cisco and Ebert, you know, did a whole put down on the film and then said, you know, we didn't even watch it. 
but I, you know, you know what it's going to be. So, I mean, it was like, what are you going to do about that? But the LA Times, you know, Variety, the Reporter, I mean, so many publications basically picked up on the fact that you can't hate something that's making fun of itself. And we love the fact that somebody looks at us, you know, into the lens and says, some folks have a strange idea of entertainment. You know, all those things suddenly made them feel like, you know what, this is fun. You know, the James Bond thing that I did, you know, for the opening. All those things sort of took away, you know, their desire to just tear it up as a, as a celebration of death and, and naked girls and, you know, the many of the things that, um, you know, obviously part five really um, kind of celebrated. Um, you know, violence for violence sake. And, and you know, it, it, I mean, it's the one film, you know, I, for instance, Quentin Tarantino, and I mean, it's his favorite Friday, part five. And it's like, what? You know, what? He goes, now it's pure, it's right. You know, just, you know so, they, you know, there are people like, you know, Quentin that just loves that fact that five is to him, you know, exactly what these movies should be. Not that he didn't like mine and, and enjoy it and all that, but he just goes, you know, if you're going to do a, a Friday, it's got to be, you know, that that nasty. So what I got from, you know, people at conventions or the fan mail, and I, you know, you mentioned it was 31, you know, years ago that the film, you know, was released on August the 1st. I mean, I get more stuff than I've ever gotten on birthdays, Christmas, <laughs> anything. I mean, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of, you know, happy anniversary and, you know, and Friday changed my life. And it's like, what? But it, 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 was, it was amazing because, you know, as a you know, film fan myself, there are certain movies that just spoke to me at the right time. You know, if, if you saw it, obviously, because you had a VHS or a copy or, you know, Laserdisc copy or, um, you know, now obviously DVD and, and Blu-ray, you would watch that thing and watch it and watch it. I mean, I, um, you know, my wife Nancy and I are no longer together. And, you know, I have a girlfriend now who was a child of the 80s. And I mean, she has seen that movie over a hundred times. And, and a lot of the horror movies, but this particular one was like her favorite. So it was a, it's amazing to be around somebody who's knows every line and, you know, and people when they, you know, they have these screenings and a number of fans, you know, but wrote to me a couple of days ago and said, you know, we're having the screening. Could you, you know, could you, you know, jump on the page and, and, and talk about it? I said, well, I'm going out tonight, but yeah, let me just thank everybody. And, and, you know, and it's like when I looked on the page, they were just going as the movie was playing and a bunch of them were watching it simultaneously and making, you know, comments on Facebook. You know, it, there was like all the lines back and forth and what they loved and things. And I mean, it's it's just amazing in the in this day and age how a film like this can unite so many people, you know, and you know, I get stuff from all over the world, people sending things to be autographed. Uh, talking about, you know, how, you know, Jason is who they identified with. And because of that movie, you know, he, he was this unstoppable force. And that's exactly what I felt about, you know, Frankenstein. You know, they, they gave you a power when you felt powerless. Um, and so that it's it's amazing. And uh, I, you know, I hate when they make us charge for autographs because to me, that's the one thing you can give back to people that really you know, are so complimentary and, and love, you know, the thing that you did. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a constant back and forth between, for me, you know, between me and, and the fans who, you know, it's important to them. And it's, if it's important to them, then hell, it's important to me. I would have loved to be able to meet Boris Karloff or, you know, James Whale or, you know, you know Todd Browning, all these guys that did these incredible horror movies that I love. But in those days, you know, that didn't, None of that was even possible or matter. You know, here I think we can have such a great relationship with the fans and, you know, encourage them to do, to do what they want to do, what they are dreaming to do. And, you know, if, I don't know, have you seen Friday the Game yet? Yeah, yes. yeah, and you did a little bit for that too, correct? You did a little, you yeah. wrote some segments for that? Yeah, because I wanted, you know, as, as some people know, you know, I wanted to bring Jason's father 
uh, into the the very end of that movie. And Frank said, you know, and it's in the it's in the treatment, and it was in the script. But you know, the the thought was is, oh my God, if people think that now it's going to be about Jason's dad and not Jason, and so I I understood that because they were still you know worried about what the audience that was pissed off at part five was going to think. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the game, they allowed me to do these Pamela Voorhees tapes, which is, you know, takes place um, the day uh, after Jason, you know, was reported drowned and, you know, police are talking to her and she reveals a bunch of things that I thought would be really cool for the legacy uh, that go on in there. And when I saw the trailer for the game, I went, God, uh, every other image is from my Friday, which, you know, I take as a huge compliment, um, you know, that that is kind of looked at as sort of the turning point. And, you know, Tom Matthews is in the game. Um, it, it, you know, things like that just make you go, well, when they're, when they're kind of doing the history, it, it's a, you know, huge part of it, which, again, is a huge honor for me. Oh, absolutely. And, Tom, I want to go back and uh, talk to you kind of about – uh, how you brought Jason back with the lightning. Uh, was that kind of your thought process from the beginning? Uh, did you and others have different kind of ideas you guys went through, or was that just what you decided from uh, kind of the start? Yeah, I, it was just a decision on my part, purely because, you know, I was stealing from the best, you know, Frankenstein. And I thought, if you're going to bring somebody back from the dead, I can't think of a better way than lightning, but I've got to find some way to have that happen that some sort of crazy logic. And so I, you know, borrowed again from uh, the, the, one of the opening scenes in uh, Bride of Frankenstein where, you know, I can't remember what the character's name, one of the, the German characters, that he needs, he needs to go down to the, to the windmill to make sure he sees Frankenstein's burnt bones because Frankenstein was the one who killed his daughter. Um, and, you know, the, the fact that need to go and see that they're really, really dead is sort of what I use for Tommy. You know, like I need to open up that, you know, crypt. I'm going to throw the mask in there and I'm going to, you know, set his, you know, body on fire and that'll be the end of it. And of course, you know, he loses it. You know, he starts stabbing him with that, you know, pull off the fence. And then the, the oncoming storm we've been hearing finally hits and that just happens to be the thing that gets struck and you know now now we have you know the resurrection of jason and um that was actually the first title that i had for the movie was jason has risen yeah you know and they thought uh, paramount thought it, it could be taken as like a slam at religion um but they were fine with jason lives which to me is like, you know, we were saying, you know, Jesus lives in those days, too. So, right. they, you know, they, they let that one go. But, um, yeah, they, so, yeah, that was pretty much, you know, it was, you know, as I said, you know, taking from the best um, and putting it in there and then kind of making it, you know, obviously he's not Frankenstein, but, you know, those those classic horror elements, gothic horror elements were all things that, you know, I felt would, would you know, elevate it into another aspect of the genre. Before we let you go, Tommy, you've been so generous with your time and we can't think enough. It's just a huge pleasure and an honor for us, especially growing up with this film as just part of our childhood, which is, again, like I said, that is just lovely, I'm sure, to hear as two children growing up watching Jason movies. I mean, you can't get any better than that. But before we let you go, um, one thing that to me that stands out is because, uh, to me, uh, Jason Lives was a was a, a film that two worlds collided for me and, and kind of made an impact in twofold. One, the horror movie aspect, of course, I went on to become a huge fan, but also the inclusion of the Alice Cooper song Songs, introduced me to uh, to Alice Cooper. It turned me into a huge Alice Cooper fan. I've seen Alice live more times than any other band or artist. Uh, he's one of my favorites, and it all started with that. I wasn't familiar with his 70s work until after your film. Those those songs were a huge part of this, especially given the pop culture at the time. You know, kind of the 80s rock was so huge, and to bring those songs in, I think, added another element to what Jason Lives was. How did you get Alice involved? Well, that's, there's, i got to give you a quick little backstory there. You know, I'm you know, out of the 60s, you know, I was a rock and roll lead singer. And our band, The Sloths, um, we opened for The Doors, Iron Butterfly, Pink Floyd, uh, Love, I mean, the Beats, all these groups. And there was also a group at that time called The Naz. Yeah. And um, 
And uh, Vincent from Texas was this dude I knew uh, at Frank Zappa's house. And in fact, I think we actually played on one bill together where there was a, like three or four bands, but I didn't really pay much attention to them. Um, and But I did talk to Vincent from time to time at Zappa's place. And then, you know, I ended up, you know, leaving rock and roll in 69 when I went to Paris to study with Marceau to try to be a better lead singer performer, uh, you know, more visual than the guys that I idolized at that time, you know, the Mick Jaggers and the Roger Daltrys and all those, you know, incredible bands uh, from England. So, you know, when Alice became Alice, I, you know, I never saw him live. I had really no connection other than, shit, he's doing what I would have loved to have done, mixing horror and rock and roll. And so by the time we got to Friday, uh, and we were, you know, I was putting in rock music and stuff into it. Uh, here again, the wonderful Frank Mancuso Jr. said, uh, listen, uh, they, Alice Cooper's uh, management has come to us, you know, and they'd be interested in, you know, Alice doing a song. And Alice's career at that time was kind of waning a bit. And this was kind of Alice's resurrection, too. Yeah, um, it just, was. You know, you know, uh, Jason lives is now Alice lives too. So he, you know, he did one version uh, of the song, which I thought was really cool, but they didn't think it was eighties enough. So they went back and they added the synthesizers and, you know, the beat changed up the beat and stuff, which is the, the version that you hear now in the movie. And then, you know, we listened to that album and I went, can we get some other songs? And it was like, yeah, yeah, sure. So, you know, we put in Teenage Frankenstein and Hard Rock Summer. And, uh, it, you know, it, it just, you know, we tried to find other songs, uh, I'm No Animal, and things that all sort of fit in with that whole vibe. And, you know, when the music video was going to get done, you know, I, I really wanted to do it, but the record label already had this guy that they always work with, so unfortunately, you know, I didn't do it. So to this day, uh, you know, I see Alice now finally, you know, in performance, which I just thought was fucking amazing. And interesting enough, this this Saturday, night, this upcoming Saturday night, my band The Floss are going to be playing in Las Vegas. We just found out Alice and Deep Purple are also playing on that night, so we'll probably have ten people, and they'll have ten thousand. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is that is unbelievable. Look forward to keeping up with that, man. Because you and Alice are actually, I think, the exact same age. Not to give the number away, you and Alice, I believe, they're ex- are the exact same age, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, and he, you know, as I said, he's doing all the stuff that I really wish that if I stayed with rock and roll, I, because I was blowing shit up on stage. I was, you know, making like I set myself on fire. You know, I did all the stuff as I'm doing now with the floss. And I mean, our album is called Back from the Break. Um, so there's that whole tie-in too with, you know, the, the horror aspect with the things that I'm doing. And when I do a lot of these conventions and shows, I'll do Man Behind the Mask and I can do Alice's voice. So, you know, we do it, you know, in, in, in the you know, kind of classic rock way that, you know, when I first heard the song, but, you know, basically it's the same thing, but without all the, you know, the synths and 80 sounds. It definitely sounds more 70s, more kind of in the old Alice vein. But, it, you know, it, you know, I'd love to get on stage with him at some point and, you know, do that with him. Because I know he he, he loves the movie. He's been very supportive, you know, with it. And, uh, you know, we just have not been in the same room at the same time yet. But it'll it'll happen. Well, this is great, and just pulling it up right now and seeing the the slots and seeing uh, your group photo and the logo and stuff, definitely reminiscent of that, definitely a throwback. It says, and one of the headlines here says, after 50 years, garage rockers, the slots are back from the grave. So I guess that, yeah. <laughs> that's that's a good, and that's yeah. great. We also do a, a music yeah. podcast. We're good friends with all of Alice's band members. We'd love to, to, to come back, have you come back on, and we'll talk about the slots. If you guys ever do a tour anywhere in the Midwest, I don't know if you get out here that much, but we'd love to catch up and come see you guys for sure, man. Yeah, we, we bounce around. We haven't got to the Midwest yet, which pisses me off because, you know, we don't have proper representation still, you know, after five years of us doing this. Um, but, yeah, you know, check out the uh, the music video, One Way Out, uh, on YouTube, um, and you kind of, you know, see my performing style and some of the tricks and things that I put in the, sh- you know, in, in the act, um, as well as there's, you know, 
just, just see the album, and I'm going to listen to the album too. I'd love you to love to hear what you guys think because um, it is very old school, and there's a lot of you know, you know, want a new life um, before I die, lust. I mean, you know, the songs are kind of going into that same sort of nasty, you know, teenage rock and roll because I've never grown up. I mean, I'm still thinking I'm fucking 17. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's you know, rock up and die. And that was part of the thing, too, of calling it back from the grave because the cover, on the cover, you'll see the mausoleum from, you know, my One Dark Night and where I'm going to be entombed one day. You know, a lightning bolt coming down, hitting the sloths. Uh, tombstone, you know, and Jason's mask hangs on one of the other gravestones. So, you know, I've got all these little, obviously, references to, to you know, my horror past. And uh, and the music has that very, you know, old school vibe, too. Uh, this is awesome to see, and I'd uh, be glad to keep up with you. You and I are, uh, just became Facebook friends, and we'll be able to keep up on that. And, uh, yeah, your, your, your Wikipedia page it does, doesn't mention anything about this, so, my gosh, like they they got to get this on here because this is very interesting to me. I'm just looking at the cover right now. It's really cool and just great to be, I mean, uh, I've always thought someone like you, you know, you and I would get along so well just because you just have that, you just seem to embody that, that attitude, that same, you know, the same charisma you talk about never, uh, you never really growing up. If you lose that, I think Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden said it best. He said, if you ever lose that 17 year old kid, you're, you're dead, you're done. And I yeah, guess yeah. you're someone that's never lost that. That's good. Good. Good to see. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I've done a lot of to some people very strange. Other people think it's very cool. Like, you know, I bought a crypt in that mausoleum that uh, where we did one dark night and my name you know is on a you know dark blood red plaque and you know the thing above my name says to die will be an awfully big adventure peter pan and you know below is and then below my name are instructions of what to do once i'm on the other side of that slab in terms of how to actually pick up you know me uh, an energy from me uh possibly something visual. I mean, it's, it, it's all kind of explained in that uh, Legends Never Die uh, documentary uh, that you can see on YouTube. But, you know, for me, I did not want the show ever to end. Even after I'm gone, that becomes my third act. And I've done enough research in psychic phenomena that I think I can do something that Harry Houdini wasn't able to do because I'm planning for it in a way that, you know, he never did. That is that is so awesome, and I love the, the, that kind of thought provoking. Uh, and I tell you, Tom, you you've just been so generous, and I know uh, this week's been kind of crazy for you. We can't thank you enough, man. And let's uh, let's stay in touch here. We're we're Facebook friends, so that means we're friends in real life, I guess. If you're Facebook friends these days, that's that's as good as the next yeah, best yeah. thing, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, keep, yeah, keep checking in. I'm, I'm constantly putting things up from what fans send me, and I you know Jason's stuff, and then of course stuff about the band and. You know my dark, crazy sense of humor usually. You well, know, <laughs> find <laughs> way on the, on the little pages too. So, um, yeah, no, I'd love to stay friends with you yeah, guys and and, uh, and keep up with things. Absolutely, we'll have, have to have you on again soon on our, our Music Mania podcast. We interview a lot of people, a lot of people from Alice Cooper's band. I think his entire band, but Alice, has been on on our <laughs> on our music podcast. So we'll have to do that again so we can get more in depth with uh, with the album, what you're doing with the, the slots. We really appreciate it, Tom. Thank you so much, man. Happy anniversary. You. you know, I won't say happy birthday when that thank comes. Out. We'll say happy anniversary for 31 years for for Jason Lives, man. Thanks so much for your time, and uh, look forward to keeping up with you, man. It's been an honor. And, and thank you guys so much. You really bet. appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay. Take care.